a page turner and a heartbreaker, a tour de force of knotted tension and buried anguish. Masterly, a novel with piercing questions about humanity and humaneness. Pretty high praise for Never Let Me Go. We all like a good book blurb, but are these laudatory reviews going over the top? Nah. This is my first Ishiguro, and in my opinion, remains the peak of his work. My name's Eddie. We've been going through all of Ishiguro's books in order. Let's go. Never Let Me Go is a story told to us by Kathy H, a 31 year old who has for 11 years been working as a carer. She tells us the story of growing up in a traditional private boarding school called Hailsham, growing up with her friends Ruth and Tommy. Tommy is bullied, prone to fits of uncontrollable rage. Ruth and her friends identify the reason for this. He is insufficiently creative. It sounds like a bizarre reason, but it soon becomes clear that in this school creativity is hugely important. There are exchanges where different students will put forward the art that they've created in order for other students to swap for them. It's also important that the very best of the art is taken by a French or Belgian woman named Madame, who brings them to her gallery for unclear purposes. Madame is also outright afraid of the students. In any case, Kathy clearly cares for Tommy. She tries to help him when his favourite shirt gets ruined and kind of tries to help get his anger under control. And eventually, Tommy and Ruth, Kathy's best friend, become a couple. They form one of those, you know, three-sided shapes that are effect effective, like a romantic pyramid. <laughs> From pretty early in the novel, you get an understanding that this isn't quite a normal educational experience. They have to be extra careful with their body in order to avoid injuries and have weekly medicals. You become aware alongside the students in the novel that they are actually clones, created as part of medical science as organ donors. Not only this, but the adult Kathy actually looks after people going through these donations, including eventually Ruth and Tommy. The clones eventually give away all of their organs and complete or die. Obviously this is something that is a pretty heavy emotional weight to find out about when you're young and even to carry when you're an adult. When they're 16, students are taken outside of Hailsham to live in cottages for a few years in relative autonomy. They're kind of allowed to enjoy adult life here to an extent and actually being a teenager. It's here that we get introduced to the idea of possibles, when students look out in the world around them and see someone that they may have been cloned from. Two older students of the cottages say they've seen someone in Norfolk who Ruth could have been cloned from. She ends up only partially resembling Ruth, like, Conceivably, she could have been her possible, but in reality, they only have surface level similarities. This is pretty heartbreaking for Ruth and leads her to think that the only people they could have been cloned from are criminals or poor people in society. We find out that Kathy has actually been scanning through porn mags in order to try and find someone who could be her possible. Around this time, ideas are also thrown out about deferrals, i.e. the idea that in particular circumstances, you'd actually be able to put off your donations. The older couple have heard a suggestion that if someone is really in love, like truly in love, then they would get an exemption for a few years and be allowed to live out their life as a couple. Tommy, on the other hand, kind of believes that maybe the art was the key to their deferrals, that uh, maybe that's why the work was taken away to Madame, so she could actually find your soul and see that you're worthy of surviving. Eventually, after a fight between Kathy and Ruth that is in part to do with Tommy, the three go their separate ways for about 10 years. Kathy becomes a carer, as we've seen at the start of the novel, and she drives around the country to different donation centres, helping the people go through their final years of their life. She eventually weasels her way into becoming Ruth's carer, and Ruth has a request that the two of them, with Tommy, take a road trip to see an old abandoned boat. During that trip, Ruth apologises for having kept Tommy and Kathy apart, saying that she always knew it was them two really, and that she felt terrible for, for getting in the way. Mm, very sad. Ruth completes, and Kathy becomes Tommy's carer. The two of them are able to become a couple, at least while Tommy's health allows, as he's going through the process of donating his organs. They manage to track down Madame and head to her address together, where she's now living with Miss Emily, their former head teacher. It turns out her art gallery was not intended to lead to deferrals. Instead, the art, and Hailsham more broadly, was part of a campaign to show the world that clones, you know, had purpose, had potential, they were, they were human beings, they, they should be treated well in their lives. Tragically, that campaign failed. There is no deferral, and schools like Hailsham were being shut down. The rest of the world wasn't interested in treating them humanely. Tommy completes, and Kathy is left alone. She looks out of the Norfolk countryside and reflects back on, on all that she's lost, comparing her memories to, to rubbish caught on a bit of 
a bit of old fencing. So first the narrator, Kathy is in many ways similar to the preceding five narrators that we've gone through in the series in Ishiguro. She's reflecting back on a life squandered, looking at it with new eyes from new experience and knowledge. It's interesting that in the very first passage of the book, Kathy is trying to prove the utility of her life's work to us. She says she hasn't been a complete waste of space. Indeed, the donations of the people that she supported have all gone pretty well. However, what this means in context is pretty misleading. We can see through the experiences of Ruth and Tommy that there is no good donation. It's always going to be a horrible experience. Many people die after two donations and some even die tragically after their first. Some people have seen a lot of parallels to British bureaucracy in Kathy's story and the story of Never Let Me Go as a whole. They see a parallel with detention centres, like I don't think it's a coincidence that one of the donation centres is in Dover, a site commonly associated with immigration in British politics. Others note that Ishiguro himself was a social worker and his wife was still working as a social worker when this book was written and came out. There is something undeniably bleak about the bureaucracy of being a carer in this world. There's a lot of motorways, it's a lot of late nights and coffees and, and nameless, faceless places. And Kelly Rich has convincingly made an argument for the clones being seen as infrastructure themselves. Yeesh. <laughs> the narration style is also interesting in that you're immediately considered an insider into Kathy's story. When she talks about her experience at Hailsham, she says, I don't know how it was where you were, kind of implying that you yourself were one of these clones. This invitation of the reader is actually a fun experience, allowing you to learn alongside the characters kind of what's happening to them and what their experiences will be. You kind of have this knowledge that's not knowledge at the same time. Like when Miss Lucy kind of goes on a rant saying, you know, you're gonna die, you're gonna be made into organ donators and you need to know this. It isn't something you don't already know. You kind of did already know that, and the students did as well. It's not a shock, but it is pretty awful. Miss Lucy is an interesting character to look at, one of the guardians at the school. She has a conversation with Tommy where she says, look, you're not good at art. You're not very talented. That's fine. You don't need to worry about this, essentially because she believes that he doesn't have a future anyway. He does feel better from this for a while, but critics have pointed out that Miss Lucy is putting a false dichotomy here. Either follow Hailsham's rules, or give up. This, perhaps, is why Tommy is so angry all the time. He's raging against an unfair system in which a third option should exist, but doesn't for them. This is also why the idea of deferral is so appealing to these students. When looking at the teachers, the conversations with Madame and uh, Miss Emily are well worth looking at. They have devoted several years to the Hailsham approach, in order to convince the world that these clones are more than just organs. However, Madame and Miss Emily still don't really see the students as humans themselves. Their only vision for the clones is like a, a kinder, more well-rounded upbringing before they die. They're ignoring their humanity just the same. Class can come in here as well. Is the world a more bleaker place without Hailsham? Most likely. However, as we find out in the narrative, this experience of Hailsham is incredibly privileged. A lot of the clones don't get anything remotely close to that. One person that Cappy is a carer for gets Kathy to regale him with tales of her time at Hailsham as kind of a something nice to hear before he dies. And when she tries to ask him about his life, he doesn't want to talk about it at all. It's incredibly depressing stuff. Some critics have seen this book as kind of representative of class relations in the UK in the 1990s. Like some of these students want to be movie stars. They want to be, you know, hugely successful or even office workers, but it's just not possible for them and the teachers tell them so. I should comment briefly on the cloning aspect of the novel. Now Never Let Me Go is, is sci-fi, right? I know some critics have kind of been like, is it not sci-fi? But it's pretty clear that it is and Ishiguro says it is also. The science is essential. He, he tried different narrative techniques in order to, to tell the story, like uh, for example using radiation as a potential cause of, of the student's illness or, or some kind of disease. But he wasn't able to make it work until he settled on this idea. It was Dolly the Sheep, Shout out Dolly, who kind of inspired him to use cloning as the final angle. But Ishiguro has said that his mission in this novel was to kind of take us along a journey with these characters to kind of understand that, that their experiences are not actually that far away from our own. We all have limits to our life and we're all aware of them to an extent and our bodies will all start to break down eventually. It's just that their version of it is slightly truncated. Also, Miss Emily, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of agree with her getting fired to be fair because who tells a bunch of kids that their entire life is purposeless? Someone deeply distressed of a system, sure, but we can see through her conversation with Tommy where she's shaking with anger after talking to him. But this is really about her dislike of the system and her part in it rather than about these students entirely. In my opinion, what makes Never Let Me Go so great is this humanity. I think it's what excels this book above the rest of Ishiguro's work. The heart. The emotion, the Tommy, Kathy, and Ruth of it all. 
The three of them have a bond that feels lived in, that feels real to me, and it feels perfectly threaded throughout the novel. There's no beat that feels emotionally or narratively false. All the tiny bits of affection they have, Tommy hunting down for, for Kathy's tape in Norfolk, for example, or Kathy's attempts to cheer up Ruth when they're having a, a conflict over whether one of their teachers is actually under threat from, from you know, some kind of thing. It's not really very clear. <laughs> but also the pain feels real. Ruth lying about Kathy saying insulting things about Tommy's drawings is painful. It hurts. The resentment and love that these guys share for each other never feels anything less than true and it means their ending is all the more tragic and hurtful to us as a reader. To me at least. As well as this, it's the hope that gets me. This, this idea that Ishiguro kind of allows the characters, and even us to an extent, even though we know it's impossible, to believe that there's, there's kind of a way out, that there's a way for these guys. And it also makes you feel just as foolish and disappointed as the characters in the end. I think with a lot of readers and a lot of critics, and, and indeed with Madame herself in the novel, the image that kind of does strike you is of Kathy dancing alone, holding a doll, listening to Judy Bridgewater in the background. Whether you see this as Madame does, or whether you see this as, as Kathy kind of felt that moment, it's still incredibly sad and, um, yeah, moving. Or could the reason that I liked the novel be that Carrie Mulligan, Andrew Garfield, and Kira Knightley were in the film and are all really attractive? Listen. Anyway. This is my favourite Ishiguro and I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to talk about it with you. This book was his last for a decade. We'll next be moving on to his 2015 post-Arthurian fantasy novel. Yeah, I did say those words in that order. That is exactly what we'll be talking about. The Buried Giant. See you next time.